thank you, Nolan, for the really wonderful opening remarks. And so I'm braving the cold, as are you. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and I'm very pleased to be here at the Oral History Center to finally see it in real life. I also want to thank the Oral History Center for bringing me here and for awarding me a Riley Fellowship. Um, it is an amazing honor, and I'm very grateful. Um, this was the little book that could from the start, and so I'm, I'm kind of very pleased that it's getting the reception that it is, and that people are very interested to, to learn more about it, because there were many times in making it that I didn't think it would go any further. I start with this picture because when people think about Sudbury, they usually think of a dreary, awful, god-awful place. And this is what it looks like today. Um, and I like the contrast that it offers because it's bright, um, there's clean water that we people drink from, they swim in, um, there's vegetation, but there's also the destruction of Inco, um, you know, which was the place that drew thousands and thousands of immigrants over the course of the 20th century in the background. Um, and I was just telling Nolan, there's a big controversy right now in Sudbury because Inco Valet, which was taken by, over by Valet um, a few years ago, has decided that they no longer need the smokestack. And so there's been this whole public outpouring of whether we need the smokestack and what it means to the, to, to, to the community. And, you know, I know me, when I, when I drive from Montreal and around the corner on Highway 17 and I see that smokestack, I know that I'm home. Um, but... Other people are saying, can we get past that nostalgia and think of all the destruction, the cancers, the respiratory illnesses that it's caused. So it's kind of an interesting moment in the public discourse right now in this small community. <clears throat> and certainly you can see that we have recovered from the devastation that was the 19th and the 20th centuries in this area. So where do I begin? I want to begin by offering, and I offer this mostly to the grad students in the room because I, I think you'll be able to relate, but what would happen if your whole graduate, you know, career rested on your grandmother or your grandfather's shoulders. What would you do? That is the situation in which I found myself in 2003. So I had been studying um, foreign policy at Carleton. I'd been reading these fascinating ethnic histories of these dynamic communities in Canada. And I decided that I really liked doing that and that I wanted to switch course and stop studying foreign policy and do a social history. And I looked into it. I didn't find very much about Sudbury's Ukrainians in any of the major books about Canada's Ukrainians. And I wondered why that was the case, because I had grown up with a Baba, two Babas actually. Um, I spent a lot of time with my paternal Baba, who you're going to get to know a lot about today, Olga. Um, and every moment that I spent with her, there was a story being told. Not necessarily a lesson, but stories about a lot of the people that I hadn't lived to see. They had been, you know, they died before that I was born or when I was very young. And so Baba lived in this nostalgic, rich community where she talked about her experiences growing up ethnic in this multicultural, amazing kind of place, which was Sudbury at that time, in this dynamic community neighborhood called the Donovan, which is kind of on the city, on, on the downtown core's kind of um, northwest corner. So it was fascinating, and I wondered why those stories weren't present in the literature. And I figured if they weren't present, maybe I should do something about it. So I changed courses. I'd been doing this foreign policy, these foreign policy comprehensive fields, which is a lot of work <laughs> when you're starting a PhD. It's overwhelming. I had to do all of these fields over again. Um, in different things that would allow me to do this kind of project. I had a lot of resistance from the department. They said, is it really a good idea? Um, you know, all of the grants you came here to work on, they, they're not applied to this situation. And I said, no, I, I really think it's a good idea. And so I went to Sudbury and I had never done any oral history. I had just passed ethics review. I think it took about a year to get ethics review because there was no expedited ethics review at the time. The Tri-Council policy statement was, I think, I think it was issued in 2007 or 2008, or no, or the early 2000s, wasn't it? Or later, 1997 or something like that. Um, and I was trying to get ethics in 2003. So there was, still wasn't a streamlined proce process. It was haphazard at best. Um, I hadn't read a lot of the literature on oral history. And my plan was really to go to the National Archives, which were down the street from where I lived, and to spend the next three years in those archives researching these Ukrainians. 
Little did I know that I would go there and find nothing about Sudbury's Ukrainians, literally almost nothing. I even, um, I was working with Myron Mamruk, Mam Mamruk at the time, who was an archivist, and he had been, I remember he was, he was getting tons and tons of declassified RCMP documents about Val d'Or, Quebec and its Ukrainian community. And he had stacks that he would just, we would sit at lunch and he would have his stack and I would have like three papers. Um, so there was just nothing really flowing from the archive. And what I came to realize was a lot of these people, they were hard working, um, working class folks who didn't think about leaving records necessarily. I would later turn to Ukrainian news, language newspapers and things like that and find a lot more. Um, the RCMP documents would be a whole other story, but there just wasn't anything to get me going. And so I had this idea that I would supplement, um, you know, these archives with these oral narratives, but the, the archives would be the main source. And so that really fell flat really quickly. So I went to Sudbury when I finally got ethics approval and I had this grand plan to do 50 interviews with men, 50 Ukrainian or 50 interviews with, with women. And that would take a year and I would just plow through it and then I would write this thesis and I would be done. Well, I interviewed my Baba, which it was an awful kind of weird interview because I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and that's, that's okay. Um, there are no rules I would later find out, but I thought there were rules and I thought I had to be legitimate and objective. And I was sitting across from this woman and hearing these stories that I had heard for 30 years and thinking, what? am I going to do with this stuff and how am I going to figure out what it means and overwhelming, right? And so I have this brilliant plan. My Baba was an integral member of uh, the Ukrainian Catholic Church in Sudbury. She did pastoral visits for 35 years, was in the Women's League. Her mother was in the Women's League. My great-great-grandfather was a jock, a cantor in the church. Well-established family roots. And so I figured, I'll start there. I will send out my little bulletin press release saying that I'm looking for folks to interview. And so I do that and the priest is, it's a brand new priest. He's kind of taking over, trying to build the church back up. Lots of people are dying. It's trying to keep these old ethnic institutions going. This is part of our narrative now, um, these ethnic communities. Um, and so he publishes it, he puts it online. What 80 year old's gonna have access to online? But, and nobody calls me at all. So. I wait a week, nobody calls. I wait two weeks, nobody calls. And I start panicking because I'm literally home from Ottawa just for a couple of weeks to do research. I'm supposed to be intensely doing research. My funding is very limited. Um, nobody believes in the project. I have supervisors that are saying like, really, is this a good idea? And I'm in Sudbury and the project is literally failing. And so I go to Baba's house one, one night, a couple of days kind of after I do an interview with her. And I say like, what am I gonna do? How am I going to get through this? Am I, am I going to graduate? And I'm in tears at her kitchen table eating pierogies. It's such, an, it's such a stereotype, but it's really what was happening. And she says, well, I'll help you. I said, what? <laughs> How are you going to help me? Like, you're not an oral historian. You're not, you're not trained. And she says, well, I'll just, I'll just start calling my friends. And so this is Olga. Um, and uh, this is three generations, so I'm in the middle, obviously, my dad, my great-grandmother, who would have been one of the founding members of St. Mary's. She died when I was about four years old, and Baba. And that's in a period where I spent all of my time with Baba. I remember that period and that period, that was a play date. Um, I remember about when I was about four to six in that er eight time zone, I guess. And that's, that's Baba from the summer. She's, she just turned 88 uh, last, last Tuesday, I think. So she's still going strong. She's an amazing, dynamic woman, as many Ukrainian Babas are. And so Baba says she'll help me. So she becomes what she calls the project secretary. And literally within a couple of days, and this is just a small snapshot, her whole table is lined up with these scraps of paper of her writing down names and writing down memories of things she hadn't told me in her interview and writing down like connections of how she knows these people and what, where they live now and where they lived then. And so she's literally doing all of the groundwork for me, but I'm kind of panic, panicking because I'm supposed to be doing this, right? Like she's literally on the phone constantly. And this is, I just love this picture because, and this is, this is her calendar. It's kind of ridiculous. It's, this is nothing. This is all the people that have died, what their anniversaries are. Like no one on this calendar right now is really living. But she had a calendar full of dates. So she started lining up dates and places for people to meet me and to talk to me. And she would literally get on the phone 
And I started calling the people, but they thought I was a telemarketer and they would literally hang up on me. So she's like, I'll, I'll start calling them. So, but she did this thing where she would be like, it's Olga Zimbricky calling. And they're like, Olga, Olga who? And they started hanging up on her too. And then she started saying, it's Olga Zima, it's Olga Zima. Oh, okay. And um, so together we create this kind of list. And she's thinking, okay, I'm doing pastoral visits. Who are the people that are really sick or might pass away? We have to get their stories. They're 90, 92 years old. That's about the oldest I think I, I interviewed at that period. And so she says, well, you're not really going to feel comfortable going into these nursing homes. Some of them are in ba a bad shape. Let's just go in together. And so this is a very slippery s slope. So we start, I said, okay, I guess we'll go together. Um, my plan was that we would go together. She would introduce me to them. And then I could go back later the week, in the week, the next day, whenever they felt comfortable doing that. But the problem is we get into these old age homes and retirement homes and these people are very lonely. They're, they're not feeling very well and she brightens their day instantly because she's kind of a constant force in their life. She's there weekly. And so they say, sit down, sit down, sit down on the edge of my bed. Let, let's do this right now. And I'm like, oh, uh, oh um, what? Oh, okay. So um, I'm like this bumbling Ukrainian kid on, on, in the sidelines. Um, with Baba in the center, explaining this project in her own words and kind of going off on tangents about what she thinks it's about. And I'm kind of in the corner with my recording device, recording it all and starting the conversation like that. So right away, I'm sidelined in the pro project, right? I, I'm not the oral historian. I'm not like a PhD student. I'm not important. I'm just the granddaughter who's there to, you know, drive her around and uh, accompany her to these kind of events. So. In the early part, um, it's a, it, it gets a little awkward. And I go home a few times and I'm listening to the interviews after and my dad's kind of hearing it in the next room and he's like, why is Baba talking all the time? What's, what's she doing? Like, what's going on? And I'm like, I don't know. So, and I would literally like get, you know, in the car after dropping off Baba and like tears would start rolling down my cheeks because I'm like, I'm doing this wrong. This is not legitimate history. Like, this is not proper. This is not how I was trained to do things at all, right? So very quickly, Baba is taking things over. And so I will I usually bring, when it's closer to Sudbury, I bring her to these things so you would get an opportunity to meet her and hear her perspective. I think it's important because I talk about this sharing authority and collaborative process, but I'm doing all of the talking. So what I've tried to do tonight is integrate clips from her reflecting on the process, which you can see are very troubling for somebody like me, but not for an 88-year-old. So in, in the course of this project, you know, Baba becomes a project secretary, but she really becomes... Um, a part of the interview team as well. And, and this was, this, this seems like such a cliche too, but this was pre-selfie, selfie time. So nobody was doing this. I, I had like my first digital camera and I was literally like, smile, Baba. And um, the picture just turned out fantastic and it's actually on the cover of the book. Um, so little did I know, Baba slides into this position and, and kind of, I would say, manipulates her way into it, um, into a, this spot as an interviewer, as a co-interviewer, and she kind of co-ops the project. So this is her um, talking about what she thinks or how she was getting interviewees to talk to. Who did you call? Call my old friends first. From the Donovan? The Donovan. And the ones that I could think of that I know that live in New Sudbury or, or they scattered, you know, in the city. Yeah. So that you probably grew up with then? Yeah, the ones I grew up with, and, and you, as your thoughts, and went to bed, first thing, oh yeah, I do this one, and oh yes, this one, and, and I made a list as I was thinking, you know, coming to my mind. But did you just remember kids that you went to school with, or that lived on your street, or, because I wasn't here for that, so I don't really know. Well, we didn't get that many that I went to school with. Because most of them are dead, right? Mm -hmm. But the ones, and I, I contacted the ones from the old St. Mary's Church, and some of them said no. How do you remember them? Well, I'm in contact with them now, the present time. Mm -hmm. You know. Like in the, at the senior center and stuff? Like people yeah. that you kind of ran into? That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So most, because we did most, a lot of people that were in the Donovan first. That, that is in the Donovan. The first ones that I had. 
I didn't have no list to go by, so I had to use my memory. Yeah, and we did. We started out at the nursing homes, too, in case mm-hmm. something happened to them. Nursing home. And then the first one from the gun was Bill Semenyuk. Yep. You know? And then, you know, things start to come back. So I, I, I really cringe when I play these. I don't like playing them because... In that particular clip, Baba was really entertaining me because it was after we'd done a bunch of interviews and I was thinking, I should really start connecting people and how she connected them and make a record of that so that we have a record of the process. And I came to that late, late in the in the project after I'd gotten rid of getting all of my mad feelings about this this whole development out of my mind because I was very frustrated through most of the course of this project. And I was angry for a lot of reasons. Um, Oftentimes I wanted to open the door and just kick her out of the car sometimes. It was a very difficult relationship and um, she's entertaining me there and, and I was really trying to prompt her to tell me how she got things rolling um, and she kind of wasn't having it. So, and I'm, you know, you can see the bluntness and the kind of familiarity that we have there. I would not talk to a normal interviewer um, in that way necessarily. But we got to this point where I would literally call her and she would say something and she might disagree and then she'd yell at me and I'd yell back. And like, it's, it's a granddaughter, grandmother relationship, right? But it, it's, it's more intimate that, than that because I literally got to know her whole world and her whole social world through this project. So Baba becomes part of this team. And um, in the meantime, back in Ottawa, I'm going back and kind of... Uh, reporting back to my PhD supervisors and it, one of my supervisors actually listened to some of the interviews and she was like, Oh no, like, no, 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 this is so bad. Um, the next time you go to Sudbury, you need to leave your Bob at home. Like she's wrecking this. And so I get back to Sudbury and I actually, I tell Bob, I'm like, I'm not going to take you to interviews with the progressive Ukrainian left community because you weren't friends with them anyway. In fact, you demonized them. So did your father. So I don't want to create that like bias in the room. So she was okay with that. Um, it turns out that she knew all of the members of the Ukrainian left and she was happy talking and debating with them. Um, and I also, I didn't take her to a few others because I was trying to make a point and really kind of reassert my authority because I felt as though I had lost it. And I was constantly trying to wrestle it back and her being the dominant person that she is, the dominant Baba that she is, she had tight reins on it and wasn't letting it go. And so there was this like no give and take, which is so essential to oral history. It was not having it. She was not having it. I was not having it. And I wanted my project back, right? And so I did a couple of interviews without her and um, they sucked. Like they were awful. People didn't know who I was. Um, They didn't trust me. Um, Maybe I was asking the wrong questions. Maybe I was asking uh, two closed-ended questions like, you know, when were you born? Where were you born? Instead of tell me about where you spent your childhood. Tell me about your earliest memories. I've since learned to be a better oral historian, but certainly at that time, you know, people would answer me. They'd they'd say, I was born in Sudbury, 1941. Was it, you know, how was the depression? It, It was awful. And those were the kinds of responses I was getting. But when Baba was in the room, she would be like, well, the depression was this for me. And she'd go off and then they'd debate with her and there would be this organic process of conversation happening that I couldn't do engage with because I hadn't lived through, you know, 1930s Sudbury. So I very quickly, after doing a couple of those awful interviews, decided that Baba needed to come back on board. And so I remember, you know, we, we were at an interview and she was like, yep, 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 in the background. And the per- she didn't allow the person to really talk. And we had it out in the car on the way home. And I said, you know, Baba, I really appreciate all the help. It was, it was a very respectful conversation. I said, but, you know, you, you really have to let, we have to let these people talk because they have different stories than you. And if you want at the end, I'll leave the recorder on and you can, you can talk. So that's kind of the point where we got to. But this was like over the course of a year, we had to battle, battle, battle before we learned how to share authority or collaborate in any kind of fruitful way. So as I was saying, Baba has these kinds of narratives and um, the depression was the center of her story. And I couldn't get past it no matter how hard I tried. Um, And certainly the fact that I only went to interviewees homes once 
it really precluded me to sticking to that early part of their life because by the time they got to like 1940, 1939, they were in their teenage years or they were getting married. It was another stage of their life. We'd been there two hours and they were tired, like they were done talking. And so primarily my interviews are super rich because they reveal a lot about what it was like to grow up ethnic in Sudbury during the depression era. And that was the, the group that we kind of, um, you know, really targeted when we looked for people. Baba also had a lot of friends that came to Sudbury from Manitoba and Saskatchewan um, after the war and in the early 50s to mine. Um, and for a long time, she kept directing me to those people and we would go there and then I'd leave and I'd be like, Baba, I'm not doing history of Manitoba. I'm not doing history of Saskatchewan. Like, this is not what I want. So it took us a long time to work that out too. So this is Baba's narrative. Um, I'm going to play it for you. The sound is not great because I had like no funding and I bought the cheapest digital audio recorder. And this seems really ridiculous to say, but audio was brand new. <laughs> and I, my first recorder I bought was a tape recorder. Um, and I, I, this is, so I recorded Baba's interview and then I switched it over to a digital format and this is what resulted. So this is why we need the transcript. Um, this is what happens when you have a love for a project but you don't have the money to do it. Were there any communist attacks in the 30s on the church that you remember, or? Not on the church, but they, they knew who was a faithful Catholic at that point, and they were coming down the gun, and they were throwing stones at everybody's windows. And I remember my mother and I arguing in the bedroom, because they were throwing and breaking out around the windows, you know? And calling my father's names, and they wasn't going to have a, 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 a cousin again. We were attacked. to this because it took me a long time to really deconstruct her story and she would tell me this story all the time when I was growing up and this was why I thought communists or Ukrainian members of the Ukrainian left community were bad people because they had attacked my family right and so as a granddaughter who growing up with these stories I never really picked these stories apart or thought about them you just you take them for granted and you hear them and they become part of your family narrative and Baba gets really touchy right here when she says they picked on us don't ask me why and she really wants to shut down the conversation. And we would go into other interviews and this is what would always come up. There were two stories. This is one of them from the, de the depression. And what I came to realize in picking apart the research was that her father was a jock, a cantor at the church. He was a founding member of the church, raised a lot of money um, in house parties and different kinds of bingos and raffles and things in house. Um, he was the priest's right hand man. And he was also a minor who kind of worked his way up a little bit. I, I don't think he was ever foreman, but he, he ended up amassing quite a bit of seniority and he was well respected. And he was a good Catholic guy, right? He wasn't, he was a member of the Ukrainian left who was, um, you know, marching in the streets and trying to, um, you know, change workers, uh, working conditions and lobby for higher wages and shorter work days, et cetera, et cetera. And um, he was also, I thank Oris Martinovich for sending me uh, one of the letters that he actually wrote at one point to, I believe, an archbishop or something. But he was also just not a nice guy. And you don't want to say that about your great grandfather. Um, but, you know, I've asked him many members of my family, he just wasn't a nice guy. Like, he was just into himself. He, you know, his first priority was church, his second priority was family, and then, you know, he was a worker. He never questioned his, his where he worked or the, the conditions. He was just, one of those guys that was lucky and happy to have a job. He could support his family. Um, and he was just a pain and he would antagonize members of the other community. And what I came to realize was that there was an incredible link between Inco and the Catholic church. And at one point priests were actually having to sign letters 
um, to say that these were good Catholic members of the community and they needed to be hired. And if you didn't have one of these church stamp documents, you didn't get a job because Inca was very worried about you agitating and becoming a, like a, a problem in terms of the workforce. And so what I figure, and Baba will not clarify it because she does not want to go on record and say this or cause any controversy or make any allegations, but I figure that her dad was probably, you know, um, tattletailing and, or, you know, reporting back to his foreman and his bosses because she will, she will tell me that the bosses used to come over after night shift and my great Baba would have to come up, get up in like two o'clock in the morning and cook for like a slew of men and you had to entertain them or you would lose your job. And so... I said, what were they talking about if you, you know, you were in bed, but what were they talking about? And she goes, oh, you know, and she would never really get into it. But I suspect that he was talking about his community and he was telling them about his community, right? And who would, who would be the good workers and who wouldn't. Um, and so I suspect in doing that, he angered a lot of people who eventually attacked the house. And this was one of the most traumatic things that has, has ever happened to Baba. She was a small child and it, for me, it really signaled her kind of coming alive and, and the end of her naivety as a child, essentially, is how I kind of pick it apart in the book. Um, and another thing happened at this awful time, and the thing about Sudbury that's really fascinating is that it didn't really have a depression. There were kind of low dips, but because of the mining situation and the stability that mining offered, there were, there were layoffs, but then the men would be hired back a few months later. So it was a precarious situation, um, but it wasn't anything like, you know, being a Ukrainian in a big city or, you know, French Canadian Montreal. Like these people weren't starving necessarily. And there was a lot of community support. The boarding houses pulled together. And, you know, even if the men weren't necessarily paying the bills, they were feeding them. And this leads me to my next um, little clip from Baba. This is the second story that she tells that's incredibly important in her life kind of course about um, having a boarding house. I'm sorry, it's bad. It's bad. Alright. I'm doing terribly pressure. My father was sleeping for weeks in the 70s. He lost my house. I'm sorry. My brother had a boarding house. In the meantime, we started to build another house on Fruit Road and they completed it. And they rented to a French couple. I remember that day with four kids. We were living in the new house, and this was brand new, on Pluto. And they were 12 children, and they were on relief on welfare. And they were chopping wood in my mother's kitchen. So the wood stove in there. And my mother was having a fit. You know? What could she do? They were getting $12 a month in. And that was big money to the person. And if you were working in Bush for $5 dollars a month, So we would go into these houses and literally as soon as I would ask a question, Baba would start telling these stories. And that particularly, that particular story um, has to do, they, so this is Baba and her brother um, Steve outside of this boarding house that they, they had. It's the only kind of picture that exists of this, this place. And what she doesn't really emphasize here is that they're not that, that bad off because my great Guido 
had amassed enough money or enough you know, confidence to buy another property and build another house at this time. So yeah, they were out of a, a place to live, this boarding house, and my Baba was out of a, a, a great business, but they had another place to live. So, um, but it's always her segue. She, you know, somebody will say, we were evicted from our house, and she'll go, oh, we had it so bad too. We lost this business. And so I would get frustrated in these situations because I wanted to hear about these awful experiences that these other people had had, but she would cut in with this story and it would kind of always take precedence. So here I am in these interviews battling with these two major kind of formative narratives and they're really kind of setting up other people in terms of telling their own stories. And just to give you a sense of what happens, so this is Bill Semenyuk and um, this is a... Um, one of the guys that I fell in love with, and he grew up in that in the Donovan, um, and he's he an amazing story. Like his mother died very young, and his father and a bunch of boarders raised like three or four kids, and you know they all went on to work in the mines and and had their own families, and it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful tale. And this was the, a picture I took this past summer because I wasn't smart enough to document the process through images in the first go. But Bill's now 92, and we were delivering the Baba book. Because Baba went around to the community, obviously, as a proud Baba, and um, told everybody that they'd be getting books. So if they appeared in the book, I ordered a book for them, and it was a pleasure, true pleasure, and probably the, the, one of the best summers of my life. I got to go revisit them and hand-deliver the books and show them the pages where their stories appeared. So this is Baba and Bill having coffee this summer when we were delivering the book. But so this... Just to give you a sense, I'm going to show, play two clips from the interviews. And this is what would happen when we would go and do these interviews together. Uh, so we're just going to start with some general questions about your parents and whatever you can remember. Yes. And then we'll go into I'm just going to the first thing. Where did your dad and uh, mother come from? I thought you, they came north, but that came north from where you, where your dad and mother could come from. Your father, right? Eh? Yeah. Yeah. They came from Tarnopin, and the village was Horovsky. I have to draw a lot of people. Well, the city know. was, the nearest city was Tarnopin. Yeah. Yeah. But I knew. Horovsky. I thought it was a chore and I was not saying. It was pretty. Yeah, it's in the, it's in the document. Is it? Yeah. Well, then the nearest little village was Horovsky. But most of the people refer to it as Karoskin. Because they might have been little farming community. It was, there was like a little, there was pa little parish communities. Mm -hmm. And then there was like districts, like I would guess like yeah. offices, you know yeah, yeah. But it was all according to their churches. Because it's very hard to find it on maps even. Well, yeah, that was what do you mean No, because there were so many little yeah, ones. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. Where did they build the church in a little farming community? That's what it was. And that's what they would call it. But my mother comes from Manitoba. Oh. My mother's born in Manitoba. Oh. My, her father and her grandfather came. Yeah. So th she was born there with 11 kids. Holy goodness. And, uh, and then my mother. father wanted to get married, so they told him, go along, wait, there's one the nice girl. <laughs> so he got as far as Winnipeg, well, that wasn't good enough. He said, go to Dalton. <laughs> so he, my mother comes 38 miles north of Dalton. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> So I'll tell you how my father called around with it, but continue. <laughs> <laughs> old country, it, 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 this how is it how old country. He came to the to the farmhouse and he looked, my mother was the oldest girl and the second oldest of eleven and the boy was the oldest, Nick. So he looked at my mother and he said, My grandma, I want to marry her. <laughs> Does she marry me? And then my grandmother smiled at me and said, Oh, yeah, Miss Lyle. You So he came to my mother, and my mother stood there, 15 and a half, what did she know? She yeah. shy, you know? Holy and he God. said, you want to marry me, you kind of, this is the man? And she says, yeah, you smile. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you always say that to us, you know? Yeah. So she, when we were growing up, she said, she said, have a good time, go dancing, don't get married young. <laughs> So you can see like how little Bill is allowed to talk in this exchange, right? And we get Baba's, we I get another one of these formative stories is this, this 
really funny story about how her father leaves northern ontario looking for a wife and arrives at the farm in winnipegosis and like knocks on the door and my great great baba is only too happy to get rid of this this child right because she's got like 12 kids or something like that and she's she's it's time for her to go um and, and Baba tells this story a million times, but the problem is I, I'm in the back. You can, you, I can hear myself grumbling and going, ah, like just really frustrated. Like, come on, we're here to interview Bill. And, um, but Bob is also doing something really important here. She's setting the tone. She's establishing that trust and bringing familiarity to the space that I didn't appreciate at the time, but it opens up Bill. And, you know, before we arrived at Bill's house, Baba says, you know, his mother died. It might have been cancer. They didn't know. It was, she, he, she was gone really quickly. Don't bring it up. It's really sad. Don't bring it up. And so I didn't bring it up. But literally within five minutes of her joking around and telling the story, he goes, and yeah, and then my mom died. And like his eyes well up and we get deep into that story right away. And, and so, you know, I know in, in good oral history practice, we're supposed to go and we're supposed to meet and have coffee if maybe once, twice, get familiar um, build a relationship, but I didn't have to do that because it was already there for me. It was amazing. Um, now that I look back on it, cringing inside still a little bit. Um, another little clip that I have to show you of how this exchange was, was with this guy, Peter Chitruk, and he lived just right by the train station. So his mother's boarding house, and he still lives in the boarding house. This is us delivering a book again. Um, he's drinking non-alcoholic beer because he just had a heart attack or something, but he's, he's like 93 and he like runs around and he's crazy. Um, <laughs> and he's got like three girlfriends or something and they go gambling. It's amazing. <laughs> These people are amazing. Um, but uh, we arrive here and right away, Baba, hit, and it, he's, he's a very like a uh, very dominant kind of personality like Baba and he doesn't back off. So right away they're trying to establish their spot, their, like their space in that interview. Um, and and it's, it's fascinating. And, and of course, my Baba knew his mother, my big Baba knew his, his mother. And so there's that going on in the room as well. Um. My name probably was Alex. Chitruk. 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 Immigration, they put ZYMA. Oh. We always went by ZYMA. But this first birth certificate is ZIMA. Oh, I guess I'll forget it. I just, I love that one because I love that Bob is telling him how he, he needs to say his name. <laughs> like, and what it should have been, right? Um, and she's really trying to push forward here. And, and he eventually does. And he ends up calling his boarding, his mom's boarding house, like the Wild West show of Sudbury. Because like she used to have a German Luger under the stairs, so if anybody got out of hand when she was bootlegging, she would just take it out and wave it around, and, and everything would be fine. Like it's a crazy story, and the police would come. And one time, his mother, he was like seven, his mother had, to, had sent him outside with the German Luger to hide it in the snowbank, and, and the police found it, and they were like, "Where did where this German Luger come from?" And and she was being raided, and uh, she was like, "I don't know, backyard." It's like a park back there. It's not mine. And another time, like his, his mother was this incredible woman. She couldn't sign her name. She would sign an X, but she knew if liquor was good or bad. Like she would light it on fire and do all of these crazy things. So he, he told these amazing stories. Um, he, his mother would run into police officers and there was one time, this was the end of the raids. She had a carton of eggs and she just smashed it in the police officer's face apparently. And that was the end of raiding of her business. But they ended up being quite rich um, had a very successful boarding business. Peter ended up going on to have many failed businesses, but has lived comfortably his whole life. His mother really set him up. He was an only child. Um, his, his younger, his older brother passed away, I believe of influenza in the early thirties. Um, but an incredible kind of man. But so you can see how the assertion of authority is really playing out. Um, and certainly I have to pick through all of this when I go to write the dissertation, right? So the last clip that I want to talk about is this is my this so this is 
Again, I was forcing Baba to reflect on the process, and this is her telling me how she thinks she helped the interviews. That me, not because I know a lot of people, but it was an asset for you. Mm-hmm. Because I think, like, I was just... On my own, you would have got maybe... You would have been lucky to get 25. Mm-hmm. I would have given you the names, but you would have been lucky to get 25. No, but I mean, like, even if all, all 80 had said yes, I don't. I think the interviews would have been very different. Like, some obviously would have been the same. Mm-hmm. But I think because you were there, it was like it was like you were just visiting them, and I was just along mm-hmm. visiting them. Do you know what I mean? So it wasn't like a formal interview. No, it wasn't. Talk. And they were more open. They weren't scared to say something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And because you could look at them and just nod your head or, you know, they would say, oh, okay, you remember that. Mm-hmm. And that would just reassure them. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas, like, I don't know what it was like to live in 1945. Like, I have no idea. You know what I mean? So they couldn't. <laughs> No, but they, like, they always said that to me. Well, you wouldn't know what it was like to grow up in a depression. You wouldn't know that. No. Or, because I find, like, I find they related to you, so that's what. She's kind of full of herself. She's st- she still is, and she's probably right. I'll, I'll, I'll give her that. Um, <laughs> but there were certainly times where she hindered the conversation. Um, being a very active member in the community and, you know, being a part of that kitchen culture, which is, gossip is is surrounds all of those women right they are they're in everybody's business this is actually the reason she tells me she won't live in the ukrainian seniors home right now because they're all in each other's business meanwhile she knows their business anyway but um and so when i went to write i wrote an article actually that came out of a conference that was here an oral history conference on bootlegging and boarding and all of these things and one of the reviewers actually said well so you had these houses with 30 men what was happening with the children in them? Like, was there any, you know, molestation? Was there any, like, unsavory behavior? And I had to admit that I didn't ask these kinds of questions in the spaces with my Baba and these other older women or men, right? Because it was uncomfortable. And I certainly, part of me wouldn't have asked them anyway because I don't think it would have been fair to put people on the spot to ask them those kinds of questions with a third person who could have potentially went back to the community and said something. Um, And so... You know, and there were instances when we would be driving to an interview and Baba would brief me on the way going there, telling me what these people were and what their lives were like. She would give me her version. And then they would be often contradicted when we did the interviews. But she would say, oh, you know, that woman, she used to come to church with black eyes all the time. Her awful, her husband was awful. And then we would get to the interviews and she would, the, the woman would spend 30 minutes talking about how great her husband was, for instance. And so, you know, I, I take this approach where I don't push Um, And if people lead me down the direction, I will ask the question. Um, But so it led me to think, okay, maybe that didn't happen and maybe Baba got it wrong, or maybe they just didn't want this community insider to know their business, right? And so I think it's important to recognize the contradictions and the problems in terms of being a community insider and an outsider. So I was an outsider, she was an insider, and what we both brought to the space and how it helped and hindered that kind of exchange. And that would, again, come to bite me in the behind when I went to write the thesis and, you know, social historians are asking me these questions and I can't answer them. Um, And certainly a lot of the questions had to do with sexuality. And I I, I actually started looking in the documents, in the newspapers, at court cases. Immigrants were often the first to be, you know, publicly accused of murders, rapes, things like that. And there were instances of molestation and things in, in boarding houses. There had to be, right? There, were kind of, there was 30 men sometimes. Um, but what I came to realize is that people were telling me about how those spaces were regulated in interesting ways. Like the children would eat before the men and then the children would go to bed and then the men would come in and they would eat. So there was like a, a, an informal regulation happening where there wasn't a lot of exchanges. But then I had other people that said the boarders were like second and third fathers to them. So there was a real range of, of stories coming out um, and I had to really think about the deep layers implicit in the stories when I was really kind of analyzing them. Because I think people tell us things and sometimes they're not explicit, right? So it, it comes time for me to write my dissertation and I decide after taking all of this kind of slack from my thesis supervisors that a personalized kind of narrative isn't going to fly and that's not the objective and proper way to do oral history. So I literally sit down and start pumping out detailed summaries of the interviews and I write Baba out of all of the transcripts. Just take her place out. And I just like excise it. And I basically take her out of most of my dissertation except the parts on the on the depression. 
And what I do though, is I basically just counter like another interviewee. And that's how I write the dissertation. And it's interesting because I was so scared about writing the proper kind of dissertation. And then I get to, to the defense and they say, um, the most important thing about what you're doing is the process and the role your Baba played. So like, where is it? And so I took a lot of slack at the defense, even though I'd been kind of protecting myself and, and trying to will this process, this problematic process to go away, it came up in, in very real ways. And certainly when I went to write the book, um, I knew that it had to be front and center um, because let's face it, many of you will never go to Sudbury or will never have been in Sudbury. You won't have a con con connection to, this, to Sudbury. But I wanted to write the book in a way that it could appeal to oral historians doing oral history. I think the methodological implications are far more important than the context and the particularities of what it meant to be a Ukrainian in Sudbury. And so that's what I did. It, I got a postdoc, so I got some money. And what I did was I set up this website, sudburyukrainians.ca. And it was supposed to kind of have a life of its own. I was doing a, a course with the Canada Research Chair in Oral History, Stephen High, at the time. I just audited this course. And he was very big on place and memories and stuff. And I was still very angry about Baba and this whole role. And I was getting a lot of pressure from my family, like, you're writing a book. When's it coming out? When's it coming out? When's it coming out? Um, you know, that good ethnic, hardworking class ethic. And so I decided that I would write, I would create a website, which this is like nothing now. Um, there are far more flashier, jazzier things, but it serves a purpose and it still gets, I think, 1,500 unique visits a month, which is pretty good for a random history site. And it allowed me to kind of put the story out there before the book would, because books take a long time. Even if I had gotten my act together and I'd been okay with it, I wouldn't have been able to pump out a book very quickly and I was involved in other projects, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's basically this space where people can go, and then I, I kind of wrote the book around the website. That's how I geared it. So it explains the project. Um, for instance, uh, it shows you the social networks. Where's the, sorry, the social network. So if you hover, you can see like the, the people that we interviewed, like where they came from. Some were church members, some were neighbors, some were community acquaintances from Uno from, um, you know, the Ukrainian left, wherever, and others were family friends. And I wanted it to, I wanted, I had all these pictures too, and I wanted to bring those to life. And I knew that a publisher would only let me print maybe like five pictures, right? Because they're expensive. And I wanted this to be a community space. And I wanted as a public, as a budding public historian at the time, I wanted something to give back to the community very quickly i wanted something to give back to all of these people and their family members even though i burnt copies of their interviews and stuff some of them you know i got these amazing calls and letters from people after their family passed away and their parents hadn't told them they'd been interviewed but they found the interview recording and they were like is there anything else coming out of this project and so i also decided to create a web of stories which here it's like a circle with baba in the middle because what i realized was she was she was weaving me a web of oral history networks that I could tap into. She was at the center and everybody was around. Her story was at the center and everyone else's was building on that because her narratives were so dominant. And so what I did was I put together clips that pertain to kind of each of the chapters I wanted to write in the book. So page one is about the early period of just coming to Sudbury, establishing community networks. Part two is about the particular organizations the churches, the Orthodox and Catholic churches, the nationalist organization, and the left organization. Um, and then the third one is about how the community was actually not just one community, but many divided, polarized communities, um, where people were throwing rocks at each other, tomatoes, really not getting along. And um, then about the households, because it was the social history that I was so fond of and the boarding piece that I wrote uh, that was an, a piece in uh, Labor Litabai, it was getting a lot of attention and it's, I think it's been anthologized three times now. It was something that was really um, appealing to students. It was, it was this window into this ethnic community that they had never seen before. And so that was kind of driving my motivations. And then in 2008, as part, in part of this course, I returned to Sudbury. I felt good about the, the point that, or the, 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 the aspects that Baba had contributed to the project. Um, Stephen High and the community of folks around me at the Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling 
really encouraged me to embrace this subjective. They were like, you can't break free from what happened unless you throw them in the garbage and you never write about it. You cannot break free, like it is central. And so what I did, place was a really big aspect of our work at the center at that time. And I decided that I would go and I would interview Baba around the Donovan, around that neighborhood. And so literally we spent a day and we, we created an audio walk, a very primitive, awful audio walk, but you can still download you know, you can still download the pamphlet, and if you ever find yourself in the Donovan, which is not a very, it, it's kind of similar to North End, uh, Winnipeg, actually. Um, it was a dynamic ethnic community, very close to a fruit mine, and, and it's now a troubled area, a lot of drugs and things like that, prostitution. But there's all of these old ethnic halls, and if you click and you hover, you can hear Baba talking about those particular places that were so important. I said, take me wherever you want in your neighborhood and tell me about the places that were so important in your childhood. And that's what we did. And we, we spatialized it in what we've called since a memory scape. Um, but it's a kind of different um, way of accessing history and, and understanding place. And again, I wanted to give it back to the community because I feel passionately about this community. It's an underprivileged area. I, I went to school in that area. Um, even though I wasn't, it wasn't my school zone, but it was close to my Baba's and I could go there after school. Um, and so I didn't need to be paid, but my parents didn't pay for babysitters. Very con convenient. And so I'm passionate about this place and I, I really want people to start thinking about it differently and to think about what the history is about. And certainly, you know, if, if we've got some energetic folks here, I think you could do an amazing project like this in, in the North End and really bring some attention to, to what has become an, a kind of awful, debilitated place. Um, and then lastly, I created a photo gallery, which was meant to be a community, you won't see it here, but it's meant to be a community photo album and people have sent me in pictures and I can, I can upload to it because again, I could print five pictures in the book, right? And so I wanted this to be a place where we could bring Sudbury back together because I had to go to archives across the country to get the story of Sudbury's Ukrainians and I wanted to return it to the local community. So... I write that um, things go quite well, and um, um, and yeah, it's 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 very very well well received in the community. Um, a number of personal things kind of happened to me, um, but I eventually would go on to get the book together. And what did I kind of learn in this whole process? Well, I learned a lot, but mostly I learned this, that the apple really doesn't fall far from the tree when it comes to doing this kind of oral history. Um, and when, so when I tell people about my work, they kind of laugh. And I have this opening monologue in the book where I talk about what it was like picking up Baba at her house. And, you know, she would, she would lock and relock her house three times to make sure that it was fine. And sometimes she would come out with like not enough clothes on. So she would have to run back. It would be this whole process would be like, Oh my God, we're going to be late. We're, it's so bad to be late for an interview. It's the one thing you're not never supposed to do. Right. And she would be dawdling along. And then literally like I would unlock the car and she would always lift the handle at the same time. And like, so I would be frustrated. Right. And then she'd get in the car and she would literally like click her seatbelt or we, I would hear a click, but then it would like slowly start to crawl across her body as we'd be driving across the city. I'd have to pull over to the side and go like, Baba, what's going on? Don't you know how to use a seatbelt? And um, so we were in this antagonistic space, right? And so people often laugh when they hear that story, but then, you know, as academic historians often do, we're trained to critique and they go, yeah, well, so what's the point? Why don't you just leave Bob at home? So... My book obviously focuses on my attempts to collaborate and, and my attempts to maintain a relationship because it, this wasn't somebody I contracted out these interviews to. She was my Baba and at the end of the day she had to be my Baba. And what I grew to realize was that she had a lot at stake in this project. And you know, people at the end of their lives, they start to review their lives and like assess why they mattered. And I couldn't take that away from her. And you know, for many of these people that we we're going to see, she hadn't seen them in 30 years, even though they live in the same place. So yeah, it was, a, it was you know, an afternoon function for her, but at the same time, it was, a, it was about reconnecting her to her past and to her community. And again, I couldn't take that away from her as, as, as much as my, you know, advisors and everybody else said to. Um, 
and I, I realized that even though I was familiar with this particular kind of theory called sharing authority, which is, you know, high flute in language for saying that I bring something as an academic and as, as, as with my interview, sp- interview experience into the space and Baba or you bring something with your experiential experience into the space. And we have to respect that and we have to work together to co-create a space because we're not or sorry, co-create a source, because we're not going into an archive and just popping open a box and pulling out a document. We're actually creating history when we make oral histories, right? And to do that, we, it requires collaboration. And so what I learned was, even though I was often wrestling with Baba to share this authority, we were, however problematic and dysfunctional, we were learning how to do that. And so all oral historians start from a common premise that seeks to redefine and redistribute power through that process, right? And that's certainly what we were doing, but I want to tell you that if you engage in this and you really believe in this kind of ethos, collaboration isn't always possible. There's, there have been many people that have written about the fact that they've had to ditch the people they've been working with. And it's important to recognize that, and it's important to say, you know what, yeah, this part of the project failed, but what did I learn from it? Because I don't think there are any failures in oral history. What I think there are, are there, there, are, there, are, there are lessons. There aren't even mistakes. I'm, I, I, I'm constantly sickened when I go to oral history workshops or conferences and people you know, freak out about a rule being broken. There are no rules. People are people and we have to treat them as human beings, right? And we have to assess them um, when we're there on the ground. We cannot have any kind of predisposition predisposed kind of conceptions of what we're going to expect because they're always going to be different. And so sharing authority never looks the same twice. There are absolutely no formulas. And everybody says, what is your advice? What is your your advice? My advice is say, go with the, with, go with your gut and just act like a human being, you know, and just be willing to take in the stories. And that seems so simple. And, you know, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of wisdom behind it. But when you're in that space and you're, you're sweating and, you, and your tummy's grumbling because you're so nervous, it's really the only thing you have. You have this animal instinct to be a good listener, right? And so we have to really embrace that. And, you know, even though I was grumbling in the background of many of those clips, I just rolled with it. I just rolled with it and I decided that I would cry in the car after and I would worry about it later when I was writing the dissertation. But I rolled with it at the time. And, you know, when I had enough distance from the project and I had enough conversation and enough presentations at conferences and, and with my colleagues, and I started to feel good about it, I could embrace the process, right? I didn't have to be rejecting it constantly because that's where all of my energy was going, and I now realize it was going into this kind of negative um, energy that didn't need to be there. And certainly what I have found is that it brought me a lot closer to my Baba. I, you know, I talk to this woman three or four times a week now Um, And certainly when we're in university, when we're in college, when we're in high school, how often do you talk to your grandparents, right? You go over for family functions. Um, You know, you might call her once a week to make sure she's okay. She's still breathing. Um, You know, what did you do for your, what did you do that week? But you don't actually really engage with their world, right? Like you don't, you don't get to know their friends. You don't get to know the monotony of their every day and what drives them. And I got to do that. Like, I'm so lucky, right? And I guess I always go into these things saying, if you have older people in your lives and you, you think they have an amazing story, and I'll bet you they do because everyone's got one. That's the great thing about oral history. Everyone's got a story. They're free. Um, and we're all, we all have ears to listen. Ask the questions. Um, you will not realize how important that is for you into figuring out, in terms of figuring out who you are and where you come from and kind of where you've, how, how you've turned into the person that you've become. So important and you will regret it if you don't ask. I've had many people come up to me and say, you know, my Baba just passed away, this, you know, I'm so happy for you, but it makes me so sad. And so, you know, really stop taking advantage of those people in your life or, you know, and, and, and ask them. You will be thankful that you did. So. If somebody had told me when I started this project that Bob would be at the center of it, I, would have, I, I really would have laughed at you. And I would have said, no, no way. I'm not even going to do this project. But that's essentially what happened, right? She took over the project, and um, I also never intended to write a personal narrative. But as you can see from the project and its evolution, there was no way around it. 
it just, it couldn't have happened. And, you know, the more I think about this, the more I realize that we have to get better as oral historians in terms of reflecting and writing about our process. Because if we don't, the sources themselves are decontextualized, right? Like we don't know what the relationships were like. We don't know how that affected the conversations. And I think about this now in terms of, you know, Frankie Iacovetta's important work on Italians in Toronto, Roy Lowen's work with Mennonites in, in Manitoba and various other places since. He's, these people are connected people in their own communities, right? But we don't know that in their narratives. Like Franco was interviewing her mother and her aunts in that book. Those are the people pictured on the cover. But we don't know that in the narrative because it wasn't kosher to tell those kinds of stories. They would have delegitimized um, what those, those scholars were doing. And these are award-winning books. They're, they're, and they're, they're still studied in Canadian comprehensive fields. But we don't know very much about the people behind them who were integral members of those communities. So, you know, and how... If this is not for everybody. I really want to em emphasize that this. It takes a lot of courage. I purposely asked UBC Press to, to get me three, uh, three peer reviewers because I was so nervous that this was such a weirdo kind of hippy-dippy book. Um, and I asked for prominent people in the field like Alessandro Portelli, who's really kind of been the godfather of oral history. And they came back and they wrote really kind of difficult things about my book, but they pushed me to make it better but they never discount, discounted the fact that I in, integrated the subjective into it. Never. Never. They said it, it, it's actually about time that you do this because you're actually putting your money where your mouth is. Most people say they're sharing authority, but they never reflect on what it actually means to do it on the ground, right? And how complicated that gets and how messy it gets. That's the thing about oral history, the messiness of it. And that's not often reflected in our narratives. And so what I did in this book is I made, I told a lot of interview stories in order to tell the story, the larger story of Sudbury's Ukrainian community. Because this was a messy process of Baba telling her stories and talking over the other people. And that shaped what came out of it. And so I purposely put the more awful, cringeworthy for an oral historian stories in there because they're the most honest. And they're, they, they forced me to think more rig rigorously in terms of mapping out what this history looked like. The other thing I learned, too, was that I did not spend enough time with the other folks to really get a sense of who they were and to deconstruct those larger meanings implicit in their narratives. So you know how I took you through kind of those depressionary narratives of Baba and I said, I told you the story about the mining and et cetera, et cetera. I couldn't do that with the other people because I only spent an hour or two with them. And so I got the landscape and this is often what oral historians have done in the past. They get the landscape of a person's life. I think of, you know, Holocaust survivors that, that talk about, you know, being in the ghetto and then being in the concentration camps. And then we never know what happens after they leave the concentration camps or Europe or what happened before because they spend five minutes on it and the bulk of the two hours is spent on the Holocaust. And so it's what I learned was that I could only do that with Baba's story. And so her story had to be at the center of the narrative. And so that's precisely how I wrote the book. Each chapter goes very deep, like 10 pages is spent going into one one aspect of Baba's life story really breaking it apart and then going, all right, how does this apply to the other members of the community? How does this apply to us talking about that larger history about the community? So it's personal, but then it's larger than Baba. Um, and so if I'd given into those disciplinary insecurities that I had, you know, all throughout my PhD, and I'd listened to those worrying thoughts in my head, I never would have written this kind of book. And we would never be talking about this kind of story. And in fact, I probably wouldn't even be here in Winnipeg because many of you don't care about the history of Sudbury's Ukrainians and that's okay, right? It doesn't matter to you. It doesn't impact your life. What does matter is that I've kind of developed this methodological perspective when it comes to writing history. And, and I'm really proud of it. And I'm really, really happy that I stood by my guns and, and just went for it. I'm gonna end by just saying that the most amazing thing happened this summer I spent the summer, so UBC publishes your book and they only release it in hardcover and it's like $90. And Baba was going around to the community, kind of peddling it out and saying, my, my, my granddaughter's book's out, you're in it, you're in it. And everyone wanted to, to read it and buy it. But I couldn't, I couldn't get, I couldn't ask them to pay $90. Like that's for a book, that's crazy. And so UBC released 
like 20 copies to me originally and I started selling them out of the trunk of my car in Sudbury because I was there doing another project and um, we sold out we sold out and in the process I was I was um, I was planning a big book launch in Sudbury because again I wanted to give all of this back to the community finally after 10 years and so I was doing publicity and everyone wanted these books and Bob was like don't sell the books they won't come to the book launch so we pulled back and um, ended up selling a lot of books because people were really into this and on September 21st, in the basement of the church that my great-grandparents built, we had a huge community turnout, 200 people from all fa facets of the community, like the left community, the nationalists, the Orthodox folks. And they all came together and they shared a meal. And this was one of the, the most amazing moments kind of of my life. It was, it was, it was fantastic. And these were folks that said, they would never have thought to step foot in the church ever. They were, you know, outliers. And they came. They came because I asked them. I visited most of the people that I interviewed that were still alive, and they all came. And I made it into a huge community event. I, I wanted it to be inclusive as possible. I asked, there's a jubilee kind of folk ensemble that originated out of the Ukrainian left community of all of the retired folks. Very few of them are Ukrainian now, but the idea is the spirit from the left Ukrainian. They played. I had the library come and set up a, like a how to do family history um, section. I had uh, the local archive representative there, and that was the place that I donated all of my sources to and the interviews where people can go listen to them. They're in the process of being put up on their website. And I brought all of these people together to show them how they could access their own history in their own community. And I'm gonna leave you with, with a little video, it's like a one minute clip of, of kind of the energy that was in the room that day. And I wish I could keep it going. And so I started out by saying like, this is the little book that could, and it, it is a little book that did actually. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's where I'd like to end right now. Okay.